Thank you for joining us today. Feel free at any time to make a comment or ask a question. Now, if I ask you what naturalist John James Audubon, artist Hiram Powers, and the Marquis de Lafayette had in common, you might guess the Western Museum by now because that's our subject today, and you would be correct. I'm Nikki DeVise. I'm a reference librarian at the Cincinnati History Library and Archives, which dates back to 1831, and our collection holds material which predates the founding of Cincinnati in 1788. Now, don't let the name Western Museum conjure up cowboys and horses in your mind. In 1800, Cincinnati was at the western edge of its European civilization. I made that word up, in the United States, hence the name. Uh, let me put a plug in here for a book titled The Pioneers by David McCullough about the early settlement of Ohio. Our library has original material related to many of the subjects he covers in that book. Here are two early maps of Cincinnati. The circle in the center of the map on the left indicates the site of a Native American earthwork in the heart of downtown Cincinnati. The Western Museum would open the following year in the Cincinnati College at Fifth and Main, where the Mercantile Library is today. The map on the right has the Western Museum location referenced as number six in the legend, as well as other prominent buildings. We have over 700 maps in our collection covering several hundred years, mainly of Cincinnati and Hamilton County, but also some of a wider scope. You can search by date for maps of the city as well. Just a note, Cincinnati had a library by the year 1814. Daniel Drake was referred to as the Benjamin Franklin of Cincinnati. He participated in scientific, political, social, economic, and cultural activities in this area from 1815 to 1850. He published many works, including the book, Natural and Statistical View, or Pictures of Cincinnati, which contains information involving the geology, botany, and mineralogy, meteorology of the region, as well as observations on late earthquakes, aurora borealis, and the southwest wind. In 1818, there was already one museum in Cincinnati, Letton and Willits. William Steele proposed the founding of a public museum to Dr. Drake. Drake was busy founding other institutions, the Lancaster Seminary, the Medical College, and the Poor House and Hospital, but took the time to organize and participate in the Western Museum Society, raising money for it as well. His idea was that it should make possible a better understanding of man's natural surroundings by providing the Ohio Valley with the scientific cabinet of natural and artificial objects. Be careful what you wish for. In our manuscript collection, we have original letters from Daniel Drake to members of his family and others. We have a great many books and pamphlets written by him, as well as the map engraved for his 1815 book. There's controversy surrounding the location Drake gave for Fort Washington on that map, which we will not go into here. From a young age, John James Audubon was more interested in the natural world around him than in any business venture. As the first employee of the Western Museum, he worked as a taxidermist and painter before leaving Cincinnati in 1820. His artworks were sold page by page on a subscription basis with a subscriber often binding the pages into a four volume set. These sets have been called the most important and most beautiful color plate book ever published and sell for upwards of $10 million today. Many organizations promoting the protection of wildlife bear the Audubon name. The first mention of Audubon in our library collection is an 1820 letter written by Robert Todd Lytle to his father William, then president of Cincinnati College. In it, Robert mentions that Audubon would make a fine teacher of French or drawing. We have Audubon folios in our collection. Think coffee table book size, the Birds of America 1839 and the Quadrupeds of North America 1849. These contain colored lithograph plates. Due to their rarity and value, some have restricted access with demonstrated need and appointments required. In addition to Audubon prints in our collection, remarkably, we have two stones which were used to produce his lithographs. The reason this is so rare is that once a printing run was complete, the image would be sanded off and a different image carved into the surface. The stones we have depict a white wolf and a bobcat. 
Uh, this, you see, is a relatively recent painting done by Devere Burt, former director of the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History. Titled Dawn of Dreams, Devere told me it depicts Drake and Audubon in front of the museum on a March morning in 1820. Audubon is dressed for the field and has a pack animal with him, suggesting he will be away from the museum for several days, gathering specimens for the collection. Audubon spent much of his life traveling. He loved to find and identify unknown species of wildlife and paint animals in their natural habitat. His talent was recognized, but he never became a financial success during his lifetime, like so many other artists and musicians whose work bring vast sums today. Much responsibility fell on his wife, Lucy Bakewell Audubon, who showed tremendous character. During, uh, due to financial need after bad business ventures by her sons, she went back to work as a governess at age 70, years after John's death. She is credited with contributing enormously to her husband's artistic success. On our website, you can see actual letters and a description of other letters from the Bakewell Audubon family papers. What you are seeing here is a letter from Lucy to her brother discussing the sale of copper plates used in the creation of her husband's work. After two years of planning, collecting, and organizing specimens, the Western Museum opened to the public on June 10, 1820. Perhaps the most significant exhibit, both in terms of size and importance, were numerous mastodon bones and fossils collected at Big Bone Lake, Kentucky. Thomas Jefferson had sent William Clark there in 1807 for a paleontological excavation. By virtue of that excursion, Big Bone Lake is considered the birthplace of American vertebrate paleontology. It is possible that some of the Western Museum specimens are among those in our collection today, but we don't have the records to prove that. Um, some people pronounce his name as Dorfoy, but I'll go with the French pronunciation, Dorfay. He was recruited from New Orleans by the Western Museum Society around 1820. One account describes him as a wandering naturalist and showman of uncertain antecedents. He was knowledgeable about things of a scientific nature and a flamboyant showman pre-P.T. Barnum era. Unfortunately, several museum benefactors had lost heavily during the Panic of 1819 and were unable to continue their support of the museum. So ownership was transferred of the collections and the museum to Dorfe in 1823. The only caveat being that the original members would be able to visit the museum for free. Dorfay items we have in the collection, including the miniature painting on ivory you see here. It's actually a pin. His blonde hair, blue eyes, and aquiline nose are clearly depicted. There is a small oval glass piece at the back through which can be seen two strands of blonde hair intertwined in a true lover's knot and two little wisps alongside of these. We have his scrapbook too. It's a fascinating mixture of drawings, charts, notes, and articles he clipped from the papers. Due to the frail nature of this ledger, its use is restricted. We have two items in our archeology span collection that have Dorfe's museum and the word Omer scrawled on them. They are discoloids, circular stone objects, possibly used in the game of Chunky. We don't have the paperwork proving the provenance of these items and we're unable to trace the origin of the wear of the name Omer, uh, though it may have been a museum in New York where Dorfe went about 1839 after leaving Cincinnati. Um, you see next some um, newspaper articles, advertisements. Dorfe began marketing the museum in a big way. Hundreds of messages appear in early Cincinnati newspaper. The ad on the left is an invitation for members of the clergy of all denominations and pupils of various seminaries to visit for free in hopes of fostering a taste for these scientific treasures without which man is but little advanced in the scale of beings above the situation of the brutes. The other paper says $2 will be charged to a gentleman for the privilege of visiting the museum for a year, $3 if accompanied by a lady. This fee included attendance at the winter lectures on all sorts of topics of a scientific nature. 
where afterward nitrous oxide would be administered to the guests. Our collection holds a wide range of original bound newspapers dating back to the very first one, the Sentinel of the Northwestern Territory in 1793. Okay, this man is Condi Ragway. He was a noted politician and free trade advocate from Philadelphia. He served as Consul General from the United States to Brazil. The oldest deposit ticket we have in our collection is his donation of four cases of South American insects in 1824. This was signed by Dorfay and included the promise that these bugs would be on display in the museum at all times. I do not know why Monsieur Raguet chose Cincinnati to receive this honor. Here you see the Marquis de Lafayette, who was a French extraction, an incredibly wealthy man who inherited his fortune at age 13 and was commissioned an officer in the French army that same year. Now, just ponder that for a moment. Yeah, 13, okay. Uh, hmm. He became enamored with the American Revolutionary cause, came here, attained the rank of Major General at 19, and was instrumental in helping the U.S. win the Revolutionary War. He then went back home and did too many great things to do them any justice in a half-hour talk. In 1824, President James Monroe invited him back on kind of a victory tour where he traveled to all the states. Uh, there were only 24 by then. Um, he made it to Cincinnati in 1825. He received a hero's welcome with a parade, fireworks, a ball given in his honor, and best of all, a visit to the Western Museum. We have in our ephemera collection two invitations to that ball, the one for Mr. Turner that you see here and one received by James Finley, Think Finley Market. William Henry Harrison was chairman of that event and many other prominent local names appear on it as well. Ephemera refers to items of a fleeting nature that, meant weren't, to be, that weren't meant to be kept like tickets, programs, menus, cards. Uh, we also have the presentation sword. Well, it's more of a dagger, which Finley wore to the ball. In a description of the museum by Benjamin Drake the next year, the holdings of the museum had grown to 100 mammoth and Arctic elephant bones, 50 megalonic bones, 33 quadrupeds, 500 birds, 200 fishes, 5,000 invertebral animals, 1,000 fossils, 3,500 minerals, 325 botanical specimens, over 3,000 medals, coins, and tokens, 150 Egyptian items, 250 American antiquities, uh, over 100 microscopic designs, cosmoramic, optic, and prismarama views of, of American scenery and buildings, the tattooed head of a New Zealand chief, together with about 500 specimens of miscellaneous curiosities and some fine art. All right, now you see here, Frances Trollope. She and her husband built a large handsome manor in England on the expectation of inheriting a fortune from a childless widower uncle who was tactless enough to marry a second time and produce an heir in his old age. After a disastrous stay at a commune in Tennessee, she came to Cincinnati with the idea of selling fashionable goods and luxuries from London and Paris. Her scheme had a very limited likelihood of succeeding in 1828 Cincinnati, uh, the impediments of which were not really obvious to her. She had little appreciation for Cincinnati's prominence as the poor capital of the world. She particularly disliked it when the hogs nuzzled her hands as she walked down the street. One achievement she did accomplish, according to a source, her son, was the inspiration for two highly successful exhibits at the by then struggling Western Museum. Invisible Girl fe featured Trollope's son as an oracle and was a big success. That led to the development of a tableau inspired by Dante's Inferno called the Infernal Regions. Apparently Trollope liking, likened her arrival in Cincinnati to entering the gates of hell. But more about that later. Here's an image of the bazaar, which did not catch on, due in fact, part fact to um, gas, the gas used to light the building 
which caused it to smell like rotten eggs. It was later sold to Nicholas Longworth, then acquired by the Ohio Mechanics Institute. Later, Trollope's Folly housed a dancing school, medical school, female medical college, hydropathical establishment, convalescent home for soldiers, and a house to prostitution, not necessarily in that order. Uh, Trollope was a prolific writer of 40 books. We have in our collection several editions of her Domestic Manners of the Americans. While disparaging the city overall, she does grant that Cincinnati has not many lines to boast, but among them are two museums of natural history. Both of these contain many respectable specimens, particularly that of Mr. Dorfay, who has moreover some highly interesting Indian antiquities. Vermont native Hiram Powers moved to Cincinnati with his family and found employment in his brother's produce store. His earliest artistic endeavors include breaking into the firkins of butter and carving gasping loggerheads and irate rattlesnakes, much to the surprise of unsuspecting shoppers. His early talent for carving led him to work for Lumen Watson, a clock and organ maker. The skills he learned there led him to a position repairing the wax figures damaged on the long steamboat trip from New Orleans to the Western Museum. Soon he was sculpting figures of his own creation. After about six years at the museum, he moved to Italy and became world famous, but come, kept in touch with Cincinnatians, accepting commissions for artwork and funerary monuments, many of which can be found at Spring Grove Cemetery. We have 700 Hiram Power letters in our collection. My favorite one is the one to Nicholas Longworth, where he notes that some of my happiest days were spent at Watson's Clock Factory and my little workshop in Dorfay's Museum. We have Lumen Watson grandfather and mantle clocks, as well as other work by Powers. Now, now the real fun begins. You see before you a broadside advertising the infernal regions. This was the exhibit that saved the Western Museum from an early demise. Credits for its development is given to Dorfay and Trollope. Located on the second floor, it was kind of an early haunted house and featured wax figures carved by Powers. Sometimes real people mingled among the figures, friends and employees of the museum. As in Dante's Inferno, it depicts humans in every stage of mental and bodily torment with shrieks and moans emanating from the darkness. How shocking, literally, as an iron rail surrounding the exhibit sent jocks of electricity jolts of electricity to anyone imprudent enough to grasp at the figures within. Aside from its sensational figures, the spectacle gave evidence of great skill and ingenuity, especially in mechanics and the early application of electricity. The infernal regions were extremely popular and imitated in museums all over the country. It remained open as late as 1861. Now the mermaid you see there on the bottom half of the broadside um, was an import from Singapore, actually a monkey, actually monkey arms sewn to a fish body. And recently I saw a blog where museums from all over are posting images of the creepy things in their collections. And there are a lot of mermaid skeletons around. We have two of these original broadsides in our collection. Here's a woodcut of the museum in 1844. For the mere sum of 25 cents, you could see not only the mermaid, but a llama, a new, a rhinoceros couple, mammoth bones, and an alb alb albatross. Why can't I talk? Several of the same men involved in the creation of the Western Museum went on to form the Western Academy of Natural Sciences in 1835 with 21 charter members. This circular dates to 1845 and it solicits readers to send them any relics or fossils connected with the natural history of the West, along with a statement of the locality where they were obtained. We have six record books from this organization in our collection. One of them, a list of books in their library.
1867, the Western Museum had closed and the contents were advertised in the local papers for sale at auction. There was a lack of any records beyond 1854 in the ledgers of the Western Academy of Natural Sciences. The remaining members, funds, collections, etc., went on to form the Cincinnati Society of Natural History in 1870. What you are seeing here is a page from the first acquisition book of that group. They continued under that name until 1957 when it was changed to the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History and plans were made to move into a new building on Gilbert Avenue, which some of us might remember. Here's a close-up of that donation at the bottom of the page. By the surviving members, the entire cabinet of the Western Academy of Natural Sciences containing numerous specimens in mineralogy, lithological, geology, and paleontology, also Judaica relics, a large botanical collection, and a large and valuable scientific library. The library has the report of the Board of Commissioners for several industrial, uh, Cincinnati industrial expositions. There were at least 13 expositions held here. And these books contain lists of the medals awarded, many of which went to collections from the members of the Cincinnati Society of Natural History, who are listed by name in each category, with a description of the artifacts being so honored. Now, here's a little poem. I'm not going to read it. Um, because not everybody likes poetry, but this appeared in the paper in 1824. And even then, you see at the very end there, there's accusations that the collection was not being cared for. So let me move on. Oh, last year, the Cincinnati Museum Center held a superb exhibit titled In the, Aud in the Audubon Tradition featuring works by John Ruthven and other contemporary artists. Through a generous loan by the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County, we were able to display Audubon's four volume elephant folio set, Birds of America. I was fortunate enough to be asked to put together some material for a timeline on the Western Museum to accompany the exhibit, which is what you see here. It was so exciting to see these items together for the first time. The Western Museum and its successors overlapped in collections, personnel, finances, and the buildings which housed it all. So much more could be told of this complicated story of endurance and determination to share artifacts from the natural and unnatural world. Why did it eventually fail? In part because religious groups dropped support when Darwin and other scientists came into the picture as well as the medical profession who started backing their own laboratories instead of the museum facilities. According to Elizabeth Kellogg, these early museums were the pioneer beginnings of now numerous and distinct branches of natural history. Mineralogy, botany, geology, paleontology, embryology, anatomy, physiology, microscopy, anthropology, ethnology and zoonology. Oh my gosh, zoology. These branches were beginning to separate themselves into more specialized fields. We may add to these general trends the difficulties to be overcome in all pioneer settlements and the terrific pressure which early Cincinnati labored under from floods, diseases like cholera and malaria, and grave financial depressions, both local and national. I owe thanks to a few of my colleagues who made me aware early on in my career here of the Western Museum and inspired my interest in this fascinating Cincinnati cabinet of curiosities. I now have my own banker's box of photocopied articles, biographies, broadsides, citations, documents, downloads, ephemera, images, journals, notes, pamphlets, theses, etc related to the cast and characters of the Western Museum. There are excellent articles on this topic, as well as Drake, Dorfay, Trollope, and Powers in our digital journals. 
Um, I've got a link here. Um, so how are we doing on time? Good, perfect. Um, so now a word from our sponsor. Uh, this slide has links. First, our library catalog. You can search the printed works, uh, holdings, manuscripts, photographs, frequently asked questions, popular topics, union terminal, and guides to other types of information. Next is a link to the digital journals. All of our journals published from 1878 to 2006 appear full text searchable, uh, covering thousands of topics like the early settlement of the area, river boats, industry, famous people, war trains, Daniel Drake's map. Most of them include citations, which even if you don't want the secondary source, can lead you back to primary sources from our collection and elsewhere. Extremely helpful and time-saving for researchers. Much of what you heard today was verified by this database. The third link is our index to local history resources with, I can't believe it's 70,000 references. Although the sources are from books found in our library, some of them are available on Google Books, so you could look at them now. And then you see my email address. <laughs> Please feel free to contact us if there's anything we can work with you on. One of my favorite subjects is home and building research. It may be difficult to perform uh, a detailed search at the moment, but there are some options. Also, we have a first Friday book club meeting tomorrow on the last castle, the story of the Biltmore Estate, which has some connections to Cincinnati. Join us even if you haven't read the book. It's always a fun discussion, which leads in many different directions. And there is a link to that club on our Facebook page. So that's all I've got. Does anybody else want to contribute? Bob, one of those things came from your collection. So um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so the, the two pieces that I think you were talking about our collection from the Western Museum. Um, uh, there's a couple of discoidals. I think there's actually three that uh, oh. have uh, ink on them uh, that says um, uh, Western Museum on them, and they say, or they say Dorfoy's Museum, uh, and then they also have that sort of cryptic name, Omer, which we think we may have traced to, there was a museum in New York, and we know that Dorfoy, or Doyfe, however you want to pronounce them, went to New York. Uh, so we're thinking that's what it is. We don't simply uh, have any, we couldn't find any references in Cincinnati that made sense to the Omer thing, but I think at one time there was probably lots and lots of things in the museum, uh, the Cincinnati Museum Center, what the collections we have today that came from the Western Museum, but many of them uh, probably weren't marked and many of them were perishable things like uh, probably study skins and animals that just didn't survive, uh, you know, the two century sure. uh, it took, you know, so, uh, but there are connections there, we can see those connections uh, and I think that's pretty cool. Uh yeah, I mean, um, I wanted to look into that Omer. I just didn't get a chance yet. But yeah, Dorfoy went to, oh, Dorfoy, I don't know, whatever, just as long as you're calling. Um, I think in 1839 and, um, and started an infernal region there as well as uh, he took some of his own collections with him. And um, Glenn thinks that some of those Macedon bones could be from uh, the Western Museum. I guess there's not a huge market for things like that. So it makes sense that they would have passed through the hands of collectors and then passed back to us. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's really neat to think of. And um, I, I well, believe. It, yeah. It's interesting uh, if you look at uh, these early ledger books that, uh, you know, at least for uh, Museum of Natural History and Science, uh, there are so many things in there that we do not have that um, either disappeared or deteriorated or, or were exchanged with other people. There's, there's some amazing things in there. And of course, there's still a lot of amazing things that uh, we do have uh, that have stayed with us. But um, so a lot of these early records are absolutely fascinating. And I, when you look at 
some of those names between the Western Academy and the and in the early Cincinnati Society of Natural History, they're sort of the same people, like the James brothers and Buchanan, uh, mm -hmm. Robert Clark, all those folks. William Wood. Yeah, they show up time and time again. They're the people who are doing the publications in those uh, Cincinnati Society and Natural History publications as well. So um, those names. You see, yeah. has an herbarium, a bound volume that's has dates as early as 1823, and it has some of the same names that we see in the Society, uh, the Western Academy, and the Society right. of Natural History. Yeah. Um, I, I think mean, I think if those ledgers could ever be digitized, it might be possible to search for distinctive things in the collection that were easily identifiable that could be, um, that it could be proven that uh, it's the same item uh, by description and yeah, I think that uh, when you look at the uh, the Western Museum and then all the way up into the late 19th century in the Cincinnati Society of Natural History, I think the clientele and the rationale changes. I think early on, it, like you say, they used the word gentleman, you know. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, well-to-do Cincinnatians who were involved in it. Uh, and I think it's it's more egalitarian when you get to the end of the 19th century, museums are becoming more like what we see today for more for uh, everyone, um, not just the well-to-do. That's true, because I think at some points, some of these were subscription uh, museums where not everyone could right. uh, attend. Um, and, uh, and sometimes the prices seem kind of high, um, which would have been a burden to people um, who didn't have a lot of money to attend right. some of these. <laughs> Although when it, when it first began, the, the price was 25 cents to get in. So that's pretty um, generous. That's a lot of money today, though. I mean, 25 cents back then, um, I don't know what that is. That could be $25 today. I mean, I don't think yeah. that's a small amount back then. So. Um, but I do think it became more for the common person the later on that you go, uh, that natural history and sciences and isn't just for the elite or the well-to-do, it's for everyone. And of course that increases your, uh, your participants and who's gonna come to the museum, your visitors and so forth. So it makes sense as well. Well, and I think, I think the um, construction of the infernal regions, you know, some people feel like that uh, for lack of a better word, kind of dumbed down what they were trying to do in exposing people to science and um, artifacts and nature, um, more of a sensationalized exhibit. Um, but it had its effect in saving the museum and getting people in there. So um, yep. they did what they had to do. Yep. So Good Mickey, time. I had a question for you. Oh, okay, okay, a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. After, you said, correct me if I'm wrong, you said after a lecture, they would administer nitrous oxide to the attendees. What, what was laughing, what was that for? Just <laughs> as a, just as like a fun time for everybody to laugh together or? Let me ask, Jill, are you there? <laughs> we, we, we've seen that a number of times in a newspaper. I guess it was, weren't, people doing like later on they were doing cocaine and things yeah. and opium and and I think it was a, a recreational drug I mean when I first saw that I was like boy yo yoing <laughs> I think it was just like if you have drinks and a lecture now to bring people in you know museum wow. on gas, museum on gas. <laughs> <laughs> laughing yeah. gas that's hilarious okay never never heard of that before we could bring it back I mean, yeah, I was going to say, we might want to try that. <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to do laughing gas and then go into those uh, infernal regions. You'd, you'd never come out of there. <laughs> Very true. Thank you all so much for sticking with. You're welcome. It was very delightful, oh, Mickey. Thank you. you. I learned a lot. Yeah. It was good. Great. Thanks, Mickey. Great job. Thanks, My dream is to write a coffee table book about this. So just that would do be it. Awesome. You will do it. Do it. I'm got nothing else to do. Do it now. Oh, there's plenty to do. But okay, okay. I'll tell you says so. Thank you, everyone. All right.
Bye-bye, Bye, Nicole. Bye, guys.